Okay, so we'll begin. I'm all set up. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Sabdi, at Jeta's Grove, Anathapindika's Park. <coughs> um, for those of you who uh, read the suttas, you might know who Anathapindika is. Um, He's uh, very, uh, many, many suttas begin, um, take place in this park. So you hear that name quite often. And uh, Anatha Pindika uh, is actually a nickname. That's not his real name. Uh, let me see if I remember it. I, I think it was Sumana, maybe, or, Su or Sudara. I don't remember his, his actual name. Um, but uh, Anatha Pindika actually means um, uh, giver of alms to the poor, to the destitute. Anatha Pindika was essentially um, the richest, one of the richest man in, men in India at the time. He was like, uh, like Bill Gates rich, <laughs> like lots and lots of money. Um, and to get this grove, actually, the story goes that he put... Um, Every every inch of uh, of space on this grove, he put a gold coin so he could buy it to give to this to this the the Buddha um, and the monks uh, as a place to stay. So that's how rich he was. But he um, was so generous to not only the the monks but to everybody that he was given this name Anatha Pindika by the people of of this town Savati. So um, that's Anatha Pindika, and so he has this park that he created for the Buddha and the disciples to uh, rest and to stay in. So then the Brahmin Janusoni went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said, Master Gotama, when clansmen have gone forth from the home life to, into homelessness, out of faith in Master Gotama, do they have Master Gotama for their leader, their helper, and their guide? And do these people follow the example of Master Gotama? And the Buddha says, that is so, Brahman, that is so. When clansmen have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, out of faith in me, they have me for their leader, their helper, and their guide, and these people follow my example. And so this is actually a um, a, a good example of when we talk about uh, going for refuge, right? Going for refuge in the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. This is exactly what going for refuge is, right? Having uh, confidence and faith and looking to the Buddha um, as uh, our helper, as our guide. Um, that we we trust in him and we trust the path that he uh, points the way for us to lead down. So and he and this Brahmin, Brahmin when you hear when somebody you know a Brahmin at this point is not a a, a Buddhist monk. He's not a disciple of the Buddha. Um, so he's coming to the Buddha and he's asking these questions. And so yes, they do have me as their helper, but Master Gotama, the the Brahmin continues. Remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice, and it is hard to enjoy solitude. One would think the jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind if he has no concentration. So, of course, he's talking about um, living in the forest, living in the wilds, um, and how hard it is because of fear and dread <laughs> but we'll get to that point uh, okay and uh, buddha says that is so brahman that is so remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure seclusion is hard to practice and it is hard to enjoy solitude one would think the jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind if he has no concentration. And so this is one of the um, 
the rare suttas where the Buddha actually talks about his practice before he became a big uh, before he became the Buddha. So he says, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too considered thus: remote jungle thicket, resting places in the forest are hard to endure. The jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind if he has no concentration. I considered, I considered thus. Whenever recluses or brahmins, unpurified in bodily conduct, resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then, owing to the defect of their unpurified bodily conduct, these good recluses and brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, unpurified in bodily conduct. I am purified in bodily conduct. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with bodily conduct purified. Seeing in myself this purity of bodily conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. So what is the Buddha talking about here? He's talking about kama or karma. He's talking about um, his actions and, and how he lives his life and how that affects the world around him. Uh, you know, so he is saying that in this one, because I'm a good person, because I I, I do um, I follow virtuous principles and I do skillful acts and all this stuff. What do I have to fear? You know, he's, he, there's because I do these skillful deeds, I don't have to fear all kinds of negative, um, uh, unwholesome. Uh, Car, uh, acts happening to me, these kind of things. So he's saying, I'm purified in bodily conduct. And even if something does happen to him, it's okay. It's just that, you know, he's, he, he is purified in bodily conduct, meaning that he knows that even if he dies, he's going to go to a good destination or he's practiced the Dhamma. It's okay. He doesn't have to worry about it. So this is, he, he doesn't have that fear and dread in his mind because of this. And so he continues, I considered thus, whenever, whenever recluses or brahmins unpurified in verbal conduct, unpurified in mental conduct, unpurified in livelihood, resort to remote jungle thickets, resting places in the forest. They evoke unwholesome fear and dread, but I am purified in livelihood. I resort, I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with livelihood purified. Seeing in myself this purity of livelihood, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. And he continues on. Um, the, these next couple ones are ellipse, meaning that they're repetitions. Um, and what I'm going to be reading is just what's different in each one. Um, I considered thus... Whenever recluses or brahmins who are covetous and full of lust, etc., etc., I am uncovetous and not full of lust, with a mind of ill will and intentions of hate. I have a mind of loving kindness, overcome by sloth and torpor. I am without sloth and torpor, overcome with restlessness and unpeaceful in mind. I have a peaceful mind. So he's talking about, he's going through all the various different states, mental states, um, and uh, levels of um, skillful and unskillful acts. So, uh, overcome with restlessness and unpeaceful mind, I have a peaceful mind. Uncertain and doubting, I have gone beyond doubt. Given to self-praise and disparagement of others. I am not given to self-praise and disparagement of others. Subject to alarm and terror, I am free from trepidation. Desirous of gain, honor, and renown, dot, 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 I have few wishes. Lazy and wanting in energy, dot, 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 I am energetic. Unmindful and not fully aware, dot, 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 I am established in mindfulness. And the last one, unconcentrated and with straying mind, dot, 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 I am possessed of concentration. So he's examining all of the 
the negative mind states that could lead to, um, you know, no matter something happening and fear and dread always coming into his mind, thinking negatively, really, if you want to put it in a more modern parlance, um, having this fear and this dread and this aversion always in our mind. And he's saying, because of these reasons, I don't have that. And so, um, he continues, I consider thus, whenever recluses or brahmas devoid of wisdom, drivelers resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then, owing to the defect of their being devoid of wisdom, and drivelers, D-R-I-V-E-L-L-E-R-S, that's the word, Dri I'm assuming it's drivel, um, these good recluses and brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread, but I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest devoid of wisdom, a driveler. I am possessed of wisdom. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones possessed of wisdom. Seeing in myself this possession of wisdom, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. <clears throat> and then this is the most interesting. I enjoy this um, this paragraph. He says, I considered thus. There are specially auspicious nights of the 14th and the 15th, the 8th and the fortnight. Um, today actually is one of those specially auspicious nights. But he's um, well, these nights are new moon, full moon, and the other ones are, are quarter moons. But today is actually a full moon. So today is an auspicious night. To, uh, actually, so that works for um, for doing the sutta. So now, what if on such nights as these, I went to dwell in such awe-inspiring, and when we talk about awe-inspiring, it's using the actual um, the actual definition of the word. Like in, uh, inspiring awe is like inspiring um, almost fear, really. Oh yeah, and on the summer solstice, um, awe. No, actually, let me let me look. What is? Oh, it's, awe is a definition: a feeling of reverential respect mixed with fear or wonder. So you go into a, a dark forest at night, and you have awe, awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes as orchard shrines, woodland shrines, and tree shrines. Perhaps I might encounter that fear and dread. And later, on such speci uh, specially auspicious nights as the 14th, the 15th, 8th, and the fort of the fortnight, I dwelt in such awe-inspiring, horrifying abodes as orchard shrines, woodland shrines, and tree shrines. And while I dwelt there, a wild animal would come up to me, or a peacock would knock off a branch, or the wind would rustle in the leaves. And I thought, what now if this is that uh, what now if this is the fear and dread coming? So think about this. This is a very fascinating, interesting sutta. Because the Buddha is talking about his mindset. He's <clears throat> he's facing his fears. He's He knows that going to these places at night is going to be very fearful. So, But he goes there anyway. And so he's talking about all these animals and this, this, and this. And he says, and he's thinking to myself, what what is this fear and dread coming? And then he thought, and then the, it continues, says, I thought, why do I dwell always expecting fear and dread? What if I subdue that fear and dread while keeping the same posture that I am in when it comes upon me? So the Buddha is saying, oh, fear and dread are arising. Why? Well, just because something happens, why am I always fearing it? Why am I always dreading it? Right? He's, he's actually asking this question of our, uh, of our tendencies. Why, with, why this fear and dread? This is really very, um, very down to earth, very um, telling and very easy to see in our own minds that we experience, um, uh, that we see this. You know, why do we always, why does our mind always jump to the negative? Why does our mind always jump to, um, yeah, Rolo, when we're done, we can, uh, we can.
can you do that? Why does our mind always jump to, we're in the woods, an animal is going to come and kill us? And it's interesting because but even before I was a Buddhist, I got into this thing of facing my fears. And I started um, by going out to the woods. And I would go camping, um, you know, and... I would be in the woods, or I, I, I wouldn't necessarily be alone, but I'd be in the area I was in alone. And I started, I would camp in a tent. And over a couple of years of practicing, of, of acclimating myself, I was able to sleep out in the dark with nothing. So just sleeping out. You know, of course, I had fears, and I watched them arise, and I tried to, you know, <clears throat> um, breathe and meditate them away and, and, and avoid them and I would then I would eventually fall asleep but it was just the it's an amazing experience of actually and so when I first read the sutta I'm like oh my god that's exactly <laughs> that's exactly what I've been doing it's amazing <laughs> so <clears throat> to really actually be able to face your fear the more you face your fear the more you understand it the more you actually become free of your fear it's a really, really fascinating experience. Um, and, you know, there's been, uh, he talks about animals here. There's maybe once or twice that I remember maybe an animal being near me, but they never bothered me. You know, even when I came to the to the monastery here, um, even before I lived here, I found out that they had these platforms up in the woods, up the mountain and uh, above the monastery. And so I would go there. And the first couple times I would go there, I couldn't stay because I was just too freaked out. I would I would will myself to go up this dark, unlit path. And sometimes I would get only halfway there. And then eventually I got there. And the last couple of years, the last a year and a half, two years, I had been able to go there, sit in the platform at night. And a new moon and a full, uh, new moon meaning no light and a full moon as well. And you just see, the more you do this, and the more you practice, the more you watch your fear, the less this fear and dread arises. Okay? So it's a very fascinating um, uh, to uh, topic. And this is one of the, the main reasons why this is, you know, and this suit is not over yet. There's lots of more good stuff to come. But this, this paragraph where he talks about the Buddha is actually questioning and saying, well, why am I always fearing? <laughs> you could say fear is the human condition. Right? We fear death. We fear old age. We fear sickness. We fear loss. We fear separation. And so we always have these fears. But if we can observe those fears, know those fears, they lose their power over us. And we can do things in a more wise and skillful way. So Rolo, if you wanted to tell your story before we continue, um, or if you wanted to wait till the end of the sutta, it's up to you. One of my first experiences of true solitude was when I was about 20 years old and decided to go on a long hike in the Everglades in Florida. Oh, alligators. <laughs> I had an ambitious plan to be dropped off along the roadside of Alligator Alley. I've been there, by the way. I was there a couple years ago and hiked for 24 miles to another highway. The first day I hiked over eight hours and lost the trail because it wasn't marked well. I just headed further in the compass direction I had planned. I camped in a small tent overnight, and each hour seemed to magnify the feeling of being alone more, making it difficult to sleep. A mild sense of panic arose, but I just endured it and planned to continue on in the morning. By noon of that day, I had seen a rattlesnake on the path and saw several hunters riding in small trucks. I met armed people working on a drilling site who seemed amused that I was hiking in the glades alone, and I still was unsure of my path. I soon estimated my distance traveled and was insufficient to reach the end of the trail before running out of water 
So I decided to turn back my <laughs> yeah, the Everglades are, are um, quite a dangerous animal filled place. <laughs> A couple years ago, when I visited my parents down in Florida before I, be, you know, moved to the monastery, I went there out, out alligator alley, and uh, rode on one of those neat, uh, what you call it, uh, boats, the air boats, and all that. Saw some alligators. Ah. So you, that, that last part is interesting because you talk about a social fear. <laughs> Going back and finding your way back. Um, made a phone call to get a ride. I suppressed the feeling of failure and endured the teasing of my friends not reaching my goal. That was 30 years ago. The social fear. Fear is not just about animals in the woods, right? Fear is what do people think of me? What will they say if I do this? What will they say if I do that? Oh, and just uh, as a, I see you typing Prosper, you can continue to type, but one of the things I also wanted to mention was um, this. What the Buddha says, what if I subdue that fear and dread while keeping the same posture that I am in? When it comes upon me. So the Buddhists talk about like, okay, I'm sitting. I'm fearful. I'm not going to move. I won't move from this spot. I'm just going to watch this, um, these feelings of fear and let them go and abandon them. And so he's, he's saying he's not moving. He's not, the fear is not going to control him to make him get up or try to run away or anything like that. What if I stay in this spot? Ah, yes. We just had a bear literally rip the side of our little garbage um, shed open to get to some garbage. Although I've actually never seen a bear live. All the times I've, I've hiked in the woods, in some deep woods by myself, I've never seen a bear. Never seen a bear outside of a zoo. I've, I've been told that people have seen bears near my kuti, where the, the cabin where I used to stay, but I, I, I've never seen a bear. So the, most animals, really, even the animals of our scariest dreams, most animals do not bother humans. They're usually pretty timid. They, won't, they do their thing. They won't bother you. Um, now getting in between an, an animal and their And yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And we tend to exaggerate this. If you go out in the woods, you'll see every little, like when I'll be in the woods on the platform, every little sound is a bear. But you'd be surprised how, uh, how much noise a little squirrel makes, <laughs> especially when there's lots of leaves on the ground. You know, every little sound. Oh, it's a bear. Oh, there's something coming up to kill me. <laughs> you know? Um, but the, the, the irony of it is stuff like mountain lions, that, like they're real predators, you won't even hear them anyway. If they come for you, you're not going to know. <laughs> so you're, you're freaking out over little squirrels. That's quite interesting. But uh, I do want to continue. <laughs> is that an alligator? Scratching at my tent. So um, we'll continue on with this now. So he says, while I walked, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither stood nor sat nor laid down till I had subdued that fear and dread. While I stood, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor sat nor laid down till I had subdued that fear and dread. 
While I sat, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor laid down till I had subdued that fear and dread. While I laid down, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor sat down till I had subdued that fear and dread. So this is facing your fears, not letting that fear run you off, run you away. And, you know, we're talking a lot about the wilderness and all this kind of stuff in this. Um, but really, our fears are, um, you know, most of us are not going to be in the wilderness. That doesn't mean that we don't have fears. Fears of people breaking into a house or fears of what society is going to do to me. Fears of the world ending. Fears of my boss firing me. All of these fears. Fears of every little thing. And all of these fears keep us in a cage. All of these fears cloud our mind. All of these fears um, stop us from living a more skillful and mindful life. Yes, tons of wasted energy. Now, of course, it's not easy um, to face fears because it's so deeply ingrained in this in this human being, this human body, in this genetics, the, the flight or fight, fight or flight, right? The fear is fear is a survival mechanism. You know, when, when our ancestors were on the plains, there was a good reason to fear. And so a lot of these mechanisms um, brought into a modern perspective uh, can actually be harmful. They were, we wouldn't have survived to be this intelligent being without it. But now, in a modern um, venue, in a modern life, they can be very harmful. So, okay, now, the Buddha continues, there are Brahmin, some recluses and Brahmins who perceive day when it is night, and night when it is day. I say that on their part, this is, a, in, this is an abiding in delusion. Now, they don't obviously, they don't actually see night as day and day as night. He's talking about people with um, essentially wrong, uh, wrong perspective, wrong, um, wrong understanding. But I perceive night when it is night and day when it is day. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, a being not subject to delusion has appeared in the world for the welfare and happiness of many, out of compassion for the world. For the good, welfare, and happiness of gods and humans. It is of me indeed that, rightly speaking, this should be said. Tireless energy was aroused in me, and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind concentrated and unified. So he's talking about how, during these, the, these times, how he subdued the fear, and now the, all that energy, who, who's, who said, the wasted energy um, muse right now all of that wasted energy all that energy that we go to worrying about animals and fears and all this ah now tireless energy has been aroused and mindfulness has been established because of this my body grows tranquil and untroubled and when you have a tranquil body your mind becomes concentrated because he has overcome this fear, he has begun to delve into deeper states of concentration. And then he talks, he goes, now, quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states. I enter upon and abide in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. So um, what he's going through now is the stock phrase um, phrasing for the four jhanas. 
if you're not familiar with jhanas, jhanas are um, states of deep states of samadhi, of samatha meditation, mindfulness of, of breathing. Um, these are states that were practiced, uh, and indeed the Buddha learned before he was a um, an enlightened being. So these these states were not something that the Buddha found or invented. Um, it was actually um, technically what is called now vipassana. Um, this um, delving with insight is where the Buddha was able to um, find and use as a vehicle to awaken it. Um, and of course, these the way the Buddha teaches is that these states, these jhana states, this developing tranquility, your developing serenity, is a um, a vehicle to helping you develop wisdom and insight. So, if you know, oftentimes these days, um, you you hear teachers they'll teach only vipassana or only samatha or they'll teach them separately. But the Buddha never really the Buddha never really taught quote unquote vipassana. Vipassana in the suttas is not a meditating meditative system. Vipassana is seeing clearly. Now it has become a meditative system these days, but the Buddha never, um, very rarely do you hear the terms samatha and vipassana in the suttas. These are, it's all one practice to the Buddha. So this is him, uh, he's going to go through this. So we, I just did the first jhana. And so with the stilling of applied thought and sustained thought, I entered and abided upon the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind, without applied and sustained thought, with rapture and pleasure born of concentration. With the fading away as well of rapture, I abide in an equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which the noble ones announce. He has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure, and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. And so this is the fourth jhana, um, which according to this teaching in the suttas is the the optimal place for the development of the pasana, for the development of clear seeing of insight so the buddha says when my concentrated mind was thus purified bright unblemished rid of imperfection malleable wieldy steady and attained to imperturbability meaning that it's rock steady it's not going anywhere I directed it to knowledge of the recollection of past lives. I recollected my manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two birth, three births, four birth, five, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, a hundred, a thousand, a hundred thousand, many, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion. There I was so named of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere, and there too I was so named, of such a clan, with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such was my experience of pleasure and pain, such my life term, and passing away from there, I reappeared here. Thus, with their aspects and particulars, I recollected my manifold past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose. As happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. 
So what the Buddha is talking about is he, he's going through the, his awakening and there's these three knowledges. The first knowledge is knowledge of, of rebirth, of understanding um, that, you know, seeing that you were all of these past lives in the past and that you kept being reborn out of ignorance. Then the second one is seeing how beings pass away and are born according to their actions. Um, so he says, I directed it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate. I understood how beings pass on according to their actions thus. These were the beings who were ill-conducted in body, speech, and mind, the violers of the noble ones, wrong in their views, giving effect to wrong view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a state of deprivation, in a bad destination, in perdition, even in hell. But these worthy beings who were well conducted in body, speech, and mind, not revilers of the noble ones, right in their views, giving effect of right view in their actions, on the dissolution of the body after death, have reappeared in a good destination, even in the heavenly world. Thus with the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and I understood how beings pass on according to their action. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the middle of watch of the night. Ignorance was banished, and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished, and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. And so he goes on again, when my concentration mind, my concentrated mind was purified and bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, etc., etc., I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. The taints are the um, these things that cloud our, um, our mind, these things that defile our mind taints, asavas, these are uh, greed, hatred, and delusion, and what comes out of greed, hatred, and delusion, right? a mind of attachment, a mind of aversion, an ignorant, um, a mind of delusion because of our ignorance, so what I like to think of um, when we talk about taints and defilements, you can think about a lighthouse, think about a lighthouse that the, the glass of the lighthouse is mucked over and covered in mud and dirt and to the point where you can only, you can't really see much of the light coming out, maybe little beams of it here and there. And this practice, this meditation practice and this practice of um, living a, a virtuous, by virtuous principles and etc., this path that the Buddha showed us, is gradually chipping away of that mud and that gunk until eventually our mind is completely clear, just like a lighthouse that can brightly shine. The Buddha says, luminous is this mind, but covered in an advantageous defilement is it. So this, remember that simile of the lighthouse and you'll understand the mind. When, when he talks about taints and defilements, this is what he's talking about. So, I directed it to the knowledge of destruction of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. You might notice that as the Four Noble Truths. The definition of right understanding is understanding the Four Noble Truths through your own direct experience. I directly knew as it actually is. These are the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the origin of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the cessation of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is. This is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. 
So in this one, he the Buddha is using the the framework of the Four Noble Truths um, as a way of understanding these taints, these defilements, and this is something that's very common um, throughout the suttas, using this framework of of understanding of seeing the problem. It's like they called the Buddha the uh, the consummate physician. And it, with his Four Noble Truths, he's diagnosing our problem. He's diagnosing dukkha, or suffering, um, as, as it's mostly translated. I like to use the translation of difficult to bear. I think that makes a little bit things a little bit easier, understanding what is difficult to bear in life. But understanding the, the problem, understanding the cause of the problem, understanding that there is a way to fix the problem and understanding the way to fix the problem. That's the crux of the Four Noble Truth. Truth, And that framework is used for many, many things in the suttas. So he's using that framework in understanding the, the taints. So then he says, When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, from the taint of ignorance, when it was liberated, there came the knowledge, it is liberated. What is liberated? His mind is liberated. And why, is it, why isn't he liberated? Well, because he has broken through the delusion that there is a permanent self. That there is, so there is, there is no he to be liberated. The mind is liberated. It is liberated. I directly knew. Birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What has to be done has been done. There is no more becoming to any state of being. That is the victory cry of the Arahant. That is when you know that is the, the, your understanding that you are an awakened being and there is no more to be done. This was the third true knowledge attained by me in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and, banished and light arose. As happened in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. It's a pretty good uh, benefit for letting go of your fears, huh? <laughs> Becoming an enlightened being. Our hunts, awakened beings, are fearless ones, for there is nothing for them to fear. We are the ones who fear. So, the Buddha continues to close this out. Now, Brahman, it might be that you think perhaps the recluse Gautama is not free from lust, hate, and delusion, even today, which is why he still resorts to remote jungle thicker resting places in the forest. But you should not think thus. It is because I see two benefits that I still resort to remote jungle thicker resting places in the forest. I see a pleasant abiding for myself here and now, and I have compassion for future generations. So what the, those two things are, the first thing is that it's very pleasant. When you, don't have, when you don't have a lot of fears, it's very pleasant in the woods, in the forest. And I've experienced that myself too, when I haven't had any fears at night, just sitting there, very peaceful. It's very pleasant. It's very nice. There's not a lot of, um, uh, you know, a lot of uh, things going on in your mind and a lot of um, external uh, things to, to distract. Being in the woods, I enjoy especially being uh, being able to watch, be out at night to see the sky. You know, just there's something very peaceful of just being in that. When your when your mind is full of fear, you're not at peace. It's a heavy uh, mind that is just so controlling that you can't find peace with that mind. But a mind that has let go of fear, it's very peaceful. You can have a peaceful abiding. And so the, the line, I have compassion for future generations, what the Buddha is saying there is he wants to show a good example for future monastics 
and also for future practitioners, lay practitioners as well. The Buddha went into the woods. The Buddha practiced in remote lodgings. I should do that as well. So he has compassion for future generations. He's setting a good example for us. So, and then um, the Brahmin Janusoni goes like this. Indeed, it is because Master Gotama is an accomplished one, a fully enlightened one, that he has compassion for future generations. Magnificent Master Gotama, magnificent Master Gotama. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways as though he were turning upright what has been overthrown, revealing what is hit, was hidden, showing the way to one who is lost, or holding up a lamp in the dark for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge, and to the Dhamma, and to the Sangha of Bhikkhus. For today, let Master Gotama remember me as a lay follower, who has gone to him for refuge, for life. So friends, that is the end of the sutta. Very um, important sutta uh, on fear and dread. It's one that's really overlooked a lot. Um, I've never really heard more than maybe one or two other monks. I've never seen a talk online, one or two other monks that talk about this sutta. Um, I don't know why, because it's a wonderful sutta. And maybe it may be just because it connected with me so much that that I love to to talk about it and to to really make it more well known but um, I think it's just because uh, fear is such an important aspect of life and it's such a controlling aspect of life that it's important that we practice facing our fears And practice understanding them. When we understand our fear, we understand our motivations. We understand what controls us. There was a there's a, a wonderful movie when I was younger. It's called What About Bob, and it's a and it's a movie about um, the, there's a therapist and there's this uh, his his. Um, uh, patient is this guy named Bob, and Bob is afraid of everything. He's afraid of germs. He's afraid of going outdoors. He's afraid of all these things. And the uh, what I like to say is, I love that's it. That's it. Runs baby steps, baby steps because it's true. Baby steps. No, we're not gonna jump. We're not gonna all just okay. Everybody, right now, break. Okay, everybody, go into the woods right now. Let's go. That's not going to happen. <laughs> but we can take those steps just like I, you know, I had to go in the woods with a tent. You know, so you go in a tent and you get used to it and you and you watch your fear and you observe your fear. And then, okay, so well, you know what? I'm going to try this. And so you, when you feel you're ready, you continue. You take those baby steps, the baby steps, baby steps until one day. You're, you're out in the woods or you're speaking in public and there's no fear, right? That, what, isn't that the, the, the thing that people have the most fear of, speaking in public? It's something I enjoy so much. I, I don't have any fear of speaking in public. <laughs> so for me, it's, it's, not, it's not very fearful. But, um, you know, <clears throat> the uh, all the things that we fear, even look at um, Bill Murray fearing some people really do have that fear i've worked i've seen people who have those kind of fears that's not a that's not easy but you know for me to for me to stay out in the woods alone by myself is the equivalent to some people of opening the door and going outside that if if they're able to face their fear and go outside that is a, a wonderful victory that's a wonderful accomplishment because they're facing their fear you know they're, they're, it doesn't matter you know some people might say oh my god I, I can uh, people fear going outside how silly is that is but the fact that what that person overcame was just as great as something that you would overcome in your worst fear <clears throat> or very strong fear so it's important um, 
that we understand this, whatever our fear is. Um, one of the one of the statements that I heard that I actually used to use, um, and I still like to this day, is every day do something that scares you. It doesn't have to be something big. I mean, you don't have to jump out of a plane, although that is quite fun. Um, did I? Am I still talking, or did I lose? I lost internet.